Welcome to my second video on the forgetting subtopic as part of the memory topic for the AQA Psychology A-Level. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on retrieval failure um, and I did mention that partly in my first video on interference. Um, so retrieval failure, as I said, is, is the second part. Um, it's another way of explaining how we forget information. Uh, most notably from long-term memory. So this is where information has gone into our long-term memory and as the name says on the tin, we have failed to retrieve it. So the information is there but we can't bring it back. Um, this is thought to do with cues. Cues are really important here. So these are the hints or the hooks that you usually get with a memory stored with a memory that might help you recall that information. So if I gave you a list um, of words for you to remember uh, and asked you to recall them and you were struggling to recall them, if I told you that some of the categories those words were in, for example, that there were some cities in there or there were some pets or there were some girls' names, that might then be the, the hint, the trigger, the cue that you need to recall that information. So that's what um, retrieval failure focuses on. The idea here being that we, we've got the information but we can't recall it, we fail to retrieve because we haven't got those cues, those hints um, to help us recall them. We're going to look in more detail at two explanations of retrieval failure, context-dependent forgetting and state-dependent forgetting. So context-dependent forgetting is when the environment acts as the cue. Um, so this says that the cues that we have are external, they're to do with the, yeah, the environment that you're in, and importantly, the environment that you learn in. So there was a study done by Godden and Badley, and they had four conditions, essentially. They asked people to either learn words on land or underwater, and then recall them either on land or underwater. So the four conditions were... You either learn on land and then recalled on land, you learn on land and then recalled underwater, scuba diving gear, etc. Or you learn underwater and recalled underwater, or you learn underwater and then recalled again on land. And what they found here is when the recall environment matched the learning environment, so for example, when you learnt on land and recalled on land, or learnt while scuba diving and recalled while scuba diving your recall was better. Whereas if you try to learn on land and then recall it underwater, the recall wasn't as good or vice versa. If you learn underwater and then recalled it on land, they found it was about 40% lower recall than when your learning environment matched your recall environment. So this adds weight to the idea that your context has a, uh, a role to play in your recall and Consequently, your retrieval failure as well. Um, there'd be arguments here then saying that whatever environment you learn your psychology information in, um, be that in a classroom, you should then recall it. So your exams, your end of year exams, should be in the same environment because that will help your recall. Obviously, uh, discounting any posters or anything that's on the wall that could could help your uh, help your learning. There are, however, um, evaluations to this, so we'll look at the AO3 afterwards. But first, we'll look at the other explanation of retrieval failure, which is state-dependent forgetting. So the other was context. It was saying that your environment um, has a role to play in whether you recall. This is to do with your state. And by state, we mean your almost your emotional state, your, your, the, the state of mind that you're in at the time of learning uh, or at the time of recall. That can have an effect on retrieval failure. So Carter uh, and Cassidy, they did this by giving um, participants antihistamines. That's what you have in the summer if you've got hay fever, uh, it's an antihistamine. Um, but these antihistamines made you drowsy, they made you sleepy. So the aim of this experiment was to see whether you could recall in the same state as you learnt in um, or, or whether that would have an effect, so in, in this case being drowsy. Um, so they either asked... Um, participants to either learn while drowsy and recall while drowsy or learn while drowsy and recall while not drowsy and then the other way around. Um, so much like the, the, the scuba diver study. So there were the four conditions here. 
Um, so learning with the drug and recalling with the drug, learning with the drug and recalling with no drug, learning with no drug or recalling uh, with the drug, or learning with no drug and recalling with no drug. And what they found, again, was when there was a mismatch between the state that you were in, the mental state, drowsy in this case, your recall was worse. So actually, the people who, were, who learned drowsy and recalled drowsy, their recall was better uh, than if you maybe learned drowsy and recalled awake, or learned awake and recalled drowsy. Um, so your mental state has a, has a role to play here in your recall. And again, both of these, both state-dependent and context-dependent forgetting, are all to do with cues. The idea here is that the mental state you're in will trigger your memory and, and help you pull that information back out of your, your long-term store. Having looked at both context-dependent forgetting and state-dependent forgetting, um, Tolving came up with what's called the encoding specificity principle. Um, and that kind of, it, it, it summarises both of those findings of state-dependent and context-dependent forgetting. Um, and an overall rule is that for the cues to help, whether that's the context or the state that you're in, they need to be present at both encoding, so that's when you learn the information, and at retrieval. And so that's when you're recalling them. Um, and that makes sense. It, it's quite a straightforward, logical argument. Um, obviously, if they're not present at either, um, so say that the, you know, the environment that you're in could trigger a memory. You could have been, I don't know, you could have been looking at a radiator in a particular room when you learnt something. Obviously, looking at that radiator again then triggers that memory for you. Um, but obviously, if you weren't looking at that radiator, it's not going to trigger the memory. So that, that's what it means by the... the um, Q has to be present at encoding, and then you might not remember that information unless you're looking at that radiator again, uh, and that's where it needs to be um, present at retrieval or recall. Um, and so this kind of summarises um, retrieval failure, uh, the encoding specificity principle. So if either is, is missing, that's when forgetting occurs. So with those three together, that's kind of your AO1 for the retrieval failure idea of forgetting. Looking at some evaluations then, um, we've got four evaluative points here. Um, the first being, obviously, we've just provided you with some really good supporting research. So for AO3, um, don't forget to peel or use the Berger method for your evaluations. But one of the big benefits here is that there's some good supporting research. You've got Godden and Badley, you've got Carter uh, and Cassidy. They have tested it using experimental methods. Um, both of them tried to do that in a bit of a um, more of a externally valid way, you know, that where in real life settings, be that yeah, on land or, or, you know, people do take antihistamines and things like that. But as well as that, they were controlled, I guess they were field experiments. So you've got a bit of control there, um, but you've got it in, in real life settings as well. So you've got some nice supporting research that suggests these things happen. Um, another positive is that obviously there are then applications of this if these things are true and it seems as though they are then we could use that and that is used in the cognitive interview now you may not have looked at this you may have looked at this but after you've done the whole memory topic you'll have looked at eyewitness testimony and one way to improve eyewitness testimony is doing the cognitive interview and one part of the cognitive interview is known as context reinstatement they get witnesses of crimes to try and imagine themselves in the same situation they were when they remembered the information, when they're trying to give their witness statements. Um, and obviously that is directly using the context, the, the ideas behind context-dependent forgetting. If you can get people to get back in the mindset, think about the time, the weather, um, what it was like, that might trigger their memory. So there's actually uses for these theories. They're not just um, what we think is happening. We, we, we can actually put them into practice. So that's another positive Looking at some negatives then, um, Badley actually, I know lots of this research was, was done by him and collaborators, but he actually said, well, you know, looking at real life application, does it really have that much of an effect? The, the study that Godden, Godden and Badley did was on land versus underwater. They are very distinct, very different areas. But, you know, I mentioned maybe applying that to a school setting where actually maybe from one room to the next in a school there's not that much of a difference so would you actually see that much of a change in your recall would memory actually be affected that much by um, the environment that you're in and that's yet to be decided i guess 
uh, and actually in the real world, can we apply those findings that, that are so stark, different, you know, different landscapes underwater to on that to real world um, situations? Probably not. And, it, and even if we can, would they have such an effect? Again, probably not. So there's a bit, bit of a, a weakness in some of the research there. Uh, and again, badly uh, looking at fully explaining the, the research here, this is the fourth point, maybe there is an effect here on recall, but recognition doesn't seem to have as big an effect, um, certainly on context-dependent forgetting, doesn't seem to have as big effect on recognition as it does in recall. So what they did, they replicated the underwater study, Gordon Badley's underwater study, but this case, this time, instead of giving them a word list to then recall with no prompt, uh, where it did seem to have an effect. Here, what they did is gave them a word list and then they had to recognise. So they were shown some words and had to pick out which words were correct. And when they did that, again, they had the four conditions. Uh, they either learnt on land and recalled on land, learnt on land, recalled underwater, learnt underwater, recalled underwater, learnt under water, recalled on land. They found they didn't seem to be an effect on recognition when they were given these topics, um, but just had to recognise them rather than recall them from memory. So actually maybe context-dependent forgetting only is applicable to when you're recalling the information without any other hints or cues like you are with, with recognition than you are with recall. I just want to finish off the forgetting topic by looking at how you might get assessed on this um, and look at maybe what, what you might consider the worst case scenarios, the dreaded essay questions, um, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't ask an essay at both AS, so that would obviously be a 12 marker, or at, uh, in, in year two, so that would be a 16 marker, so just be aware of that, it could be asked at uh, any stage. Uh, but the way that it's assessed, you could get a question that asks you an overarching question about forgetting in general. So that top question, outline and evaluate explanations for forgetting for, for 12 or 16 marks. Um, in that case, you can obviously talk about both interference and retrieval failure. Um, and if, it, if you were doing that, I'll, I'll, I'll treat it as a 16 marker. Um, obviously, generally, you're looking at about 6 A01 marks. So if you're talking about interference and retrieval failure, you're only really talking about three marks for interference and then three marks for retrieval failure. And obviously, under interference, you've got proactive and retroactive. Under retrieval failure, you've got context-dependent and state-dependent. So you've got lots to talk about. That's actually quite a broad question. Uh, and actually, I think the difficulty there will be narrowing down. Me, personally, I probably would talk about both sides, but you just need to make sure you cover everything. You also need to be aware that actually you could be asked either, because they're both mentioned on the specification, you could be asked either as an essay question on their own. So I've got the two examples there. Discuss, interference, sorry, that was meant to be interference. Uh, interference, that's an explanation for forgetting. So that would obviously just be on interference, proactive, retroactive, interference. Or you could just get asked, discuss retrieval failure as an explanation for forgetting. So you need to know it all. Just be aware that, you know, the exam board haven't limited themselves in the way that they can assess this information uh, and you need to be prepared to uh, tailor your answer to the question that's there, either more broad, longer uh, as at the top or more specific um, and that's why you probably do need research uh, for both sides of the information. Thank you for listening, uh, please subscribe, uh, tell your friends about it and listen up for more videos. Thank you very much.